Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Wednesday, December 13th, 2017. Sometimes it's kind of nice to admit when you've been wrong. And your humble host had reluctantly predicted that Alabama's corruption would lead to the ascension of Bible-thumping former Supreme Court Justice Roy Moore to the United States Senate. And I was wrong, but just by about 21,000 votes. And while the pundits are spinning themselves into butter, trying to make this into a wave election and that this is what the Democrats have needed to get back on track, I reject most of the punditry that's been offered. And after the networks declared more the winner last night, I was watching CNN, and they go around and around with all these paid, uh, you know, commentators. And they got to say something, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the gig that they have. But the bottom line here, that this was an exceptionally ugly and exception, exceptionally unusual race for the U.S. Senate. And Doug Jones came out the victor, as I said, by 21,000 votes, about 1.2 million cast. And it shouldn't have been that close, running against an accused child molester, one of the most extreme anti-constitutionalists who has sat on a state Supreme Court. He defied the Constitution on a regular basis because God tells him what to do. And yeah, Roy Moore has not conceded to my knowledge uh, at this hour. And he imagines that uh, he can get close enough with the ballots that have yet to be counted. Well, that's pretty doubtful. But the bottom line here is that voters had to hold their noses. And we're going to give uh, Doug Jones a pass for at least 24 hours here. And I'll say that Roger Schuler. The investigative journalist who has exposed so much of the corruption in Alabama told us weeks before this special election that Doug Jones is no saint. He's got the Alabama virus. And we will uh, share that with you as uh, time goes on. I do want to correct one misstatement I made yesterday. I was under the uh, incorrect impression that the winner of this race would be seated almost immediately. And perhaps if it had been Roy Moore the Republicans in Alabama would have sped up the certification of the election. But the Secretary of State says uh, that's going to be at the end of December or early January. And so there will be a bit of a delay as Doug Jones assumes the seat that he narrowly won in the election yesterday. And I predict that uh, we're going to see Doug Jones adopt a profile similar to Senator Bill Nelson of Florida. Now, Nelson is nominally a Democrat, and uh, when it's a party-line vote, he is loyal to the Democratic Party. But he's a conservative and very cautious Democratic senator. You've never heard of the Bill Nelson legislation about almost anything, because he is proud to be a backbencher, and that's been his key to reelective success in Florida. And Doug Jones has to uh, run for re-election to this seat in 2020. So he has some time to prove himself to the majority of voters who are rock-ribbed Republicans and dark, dark conservatives, the people who thought Steve Bannon had a lot of good ideas. And Jones will have to uh, tread very carefully if he hopes to retain this seat. And that means that uh, he's not going to be sticking his neck out. But he will be there, I, I think, on the uh, critical party line votes. So the ever wily Donald Trump, who just uh, days ago was telling people in Florida to vote for Roy Moore in neighboring Alabama, he did robocalls, he tweeted his little butt off. And it's been so bizarre, because as you know, in the, the, the previous election, the, what essentially is the primary for the special election, Trump backed the temporary senator, the corrupt Luther Strange. 
And he went to Florida, or I'm sorry, he went to Alabama, held one of those rallies, and he very tepidly endorsed Luther Strange and, and openly mused maybe he was making a mistake. And when Strange lost, he said, oh, yeah, that was a mistake. And he shifted to Roy Moore. Well, now, of course, he's wiggling out of that. He tweeted today the uh, at 3.22 in the morning. Wow. The reason I originally endorsed Luther Strange and his numbers went up mightily <laughs> is that I said Roy Moore will not be able to win the general election. I was right. Roy worked hard, but the deck was stacked against him. What deck? The deck of the accusations of being a child sexual predator? Kind of like Trump. I mean, they, they had that in common. And so when we look at the numbers, Trump also did send out a uh, tweet last night, which uh, <laughs> he said, uh, congratulations to Doug Jones, a win is a win. But, of course, he undermined that by saying that the absentee votes uh, were critical in shifting this. I, I, I'm sorry, not the absentee, the write-in votes. And there are 22,000 people out of the uh, roughly 1.2 million votes cast who decided to write in a candidate because apparently they were Republicans who couldn't bring themselves to vote for a Democrat under any circumstances. And so Trump imagines that that is simply... Uh, a matter of subtraction from Roy Moore. And I'll credit the Washington Post fact-checkers for pointing out that for write-ins to have changed the result when the victory margin was about 20,000, Roy Moore would have needed to win 93% of those write-in votes. And if you even include all the military ballots he would have to win those by a 91% margin. So Trump uses that kind of kindergarten math, and it doesn't really apply here. And while we're talking about it, the Post also kind of recapped what happened in terms of Jill Stein allegedly stealing votes in the three critical states that Hillary Clinton lost. In Michigan, Jill Stein got 51,000 votes and Clinton lost by 10,700. In Wisconsin, Clinton lost by 22,000 and Stein got 31,000. And in Pennsylvania, Clinton lost by 44,000 votes and Stein got about 50,000. And simple-minded people say, wow, just look at that. If Jill Stein hadn't been on the ballot, Hillary Clinton would have won. But exit polls in those states showed that about 60% of Stein's Green Party voters would have stayed home or just skipped the presidential race if they didn't have the option to vote for her. And this same kind of fuzzy math was applied to Ralph Nader in 2000 by partisan Democrats who claimed that he cost Al Gore the election in Florida. So I hope that's helpful. Meanwhile, the House and Senate Republicans have reached an agreement on uh, coordinating their two bills to cut taxes for corporations and wealthy individuals. Of course, it's all secret. It was done in a back room, and we're not allowed to know the details. They have leaked that the change in the corporate rate, which was supposed to go from 35 to 20 percent, is going to inch up to 21 percent. And the top income tax rate for individuals will be 37 uh, percent instead of 39.6%. But we don't know about so much else that is uh, in the bill and what kind of things have been inserted during this conference process. Republicans are notoriously dirty about that. And so we'll have some surprises when this bill actually gets passed and kind of like a big box uh, on Christmas morning, we'll have to open it up to see what's actually in it. And uh, speaking to Mitch McConnell's deaf ear, Chuck Schumer seizes on the election of Doug Jones, which does change the complexion of the Senate. It's now uh, 51-49. And so Schumer, kind of reprising Mitch McConnell's gambit in 2016, where he said that the Republicans wouldn't even listen to the nomination of Merrick Garland for the Supreme Court because it was Obama's last year. Well, Schumer made the argument that the Republicans should delay 
the passage of the tax bill until Doug Jones gets to the Senate. And Schumer cited the issue back in 2010 when Scott Brown won in Massachusetts and picked up the, Ed Ke- the Teddy Kennedy uh, Senate seat. And that was during the uh, whole debate over Obamacare. And they had to wait. Now, Democrats spin this as uh, forbearance on their part. But they waited for Scott Brown to get to the Senate because they didn't know how he would vote. And they were desperate for a Republican vote. And in the end, they had to use different methods to avoid bringing the Affordable Care Act back to the U.S. Senate after Scott Brown uh, got elected there. So uh, (laughs) this is all spin. And, of course, McConnell is under no uh, real pressure to agree to the demand from Chuck Schumer. Last night on CNN, as I was watching the election returns, one of the talking heads quoted a fresh editorial from America's blandest newspaper, and that would be USA Today. It's an insulting paper. I rarely pick it up because it always gives short shrift to whatever it's covering, and it uh, fails to take any critical positions, and its editorials are always just so he said, she said, either or. uh, It's just not usually worth reading. And their habit is, if they run a strong editorial, they uh, pair it with some sort of a response from somebody else. And I like fairness and I like balance, but USA Today takes it to uh, a real extreme to the point of meaninglessness. With that, this editorial, entitled Will Trump's Lows Ever Hit Rock Bottom, is remarkable. Let me read some excerpts. With his latest tweet clearly implying that a United States senator would trade sexual favors for campaign cash, President Trump has shown he is not fit for office. Rock bottom is no impediment for a president who can always find room for a new low. Then they published the tweet where he attacked Kirsten Gillibrand, called her a lightweight, a total flunky for Chuck Schumer, someone who would come to his office begging for campaign contributions not so long ago and would do anything for them. Now, that's the operative phrase here, would do anything for them. Now, I agree that this is a nasty tweet. It has sexist implications. But I don't personally infer that would do anything for them means that she would give Trump sexual favors or that she would give them to anybody. I really don't see that inferred even in a remote way. But that's how USA Today took it. The editorial continues, as is the case with all Trump's digital provocations, and they link to the archive of his tweets, the president's words were deliberate. He pours the gasoline of sexist language and lights the match gleefully knowing how it will burst into flame in a country reeling from the Me Too movement. A president who would all but call Senator Gillibrand a whore is not filled to clean the toilets in the Barack Obama presidential library or to shine the shoes of George W. Bush. Where did that come from? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, they continue. Obama and Bush both failed in many ways. They broke promises and told untruths, but the basic decency of each man was never in doubt. Trump, the man, on the other hand, is uniquely awful. His sickening behavior is corrosive to the enterprise of a shared governance based on common values and the consent of the governed. It should surprise no one how low he went with Gillibrand. When accused during the campaign of sexually harassing or molesting women in the past, Trump's response was to belittle the looks of his accusers. Last October, Trump suggested he would never have groped Jessica Leeds on an airplane decades ago. Believe me, she would not be my first choice. That I can tell you. They go on to uh, list bullet points of uh, the uh, failed qualifications for reporting uh, for supporting Roy Moore in Alabama this week. Uh, Trump apparently is going for some sort of record for lying while in office. He uh, has uh, racked up 5.5 false claims per day. Trump takes advantage of any occasion, even Monday's failed terrorist attack in New York, to stir racial, religious, or ethnic strife. A man who clearly wants to put his stamp on the government, Trump hasn't even done his job when it comes to filling key government positions requiring Senate confirmation. As of last week, he had failed to nominate anyone for 60% of 1,200 key positions. Oh, and he hasn't released his taxes. 
They close by saying it's a shock that only six Democratic senators are calling for our unstable president to resign. They close with this, a president who shows such disrespect for the truth, for ethics, for the basic duties of the job, and for decency toward others, fails at the very essence of what has always made America great. Wow. <laughs> Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. Great Americans like Benny Alto, Arlene Montemarano, and Auntie Lundberg, who just opened up a new $10 a month subscription. Thank you, Auntie. And let's not forget, Casita Kojo Amenya. I'd like you to join their ranks. Come on over to PeterBCollins.com. You want to make it a Christmas gift? I'll take it. Just click on the menu button, then click on Become a Subscriber. It takes you to the sign-up page. And if you'd like to send a card or anything else, uh, correspondence about what we discuss, or uh, a little folding money, my mailing address is Box 15660, San Rafael, California, 94915. That's Box 150660, San Rafael, California, 94915. Today I'm releasing to my subscribers an interview with Law Professor Sanford Levinson. Sandy Levinson, together with his wife Cynthia, has published a new book called Fault Lines in the Constitution, The Framers, Their Fights, and the Flaws that Affect Us Today. And it's a great book, and it's accessible to younger people. It's not dumbed down, but it's also not uh, excessively complicated. And in my conversation with Sandy Levinson, which was a video interview for Marin TV here uh, where I live, he has real gripes about the Constitution and how difficult it is to replace the chief executive. Here's an excerpt. I wish the national Constitution were more like the California Constitution. For better or for worse, and I'm sure you have views on this, back in, what was it, 2003 or so, we, the people of California, rose up and fired Gray Davis. I don't know how I would have voted in that election. Um, you know, we could talk at length about Arnold Schwarzenegger's replacement, but the fact is that the people of California didn't feel impotent with regard to responding to a governor they had lost confidence in. Whereas in the country, and the same thing is true incidentally in Wisconsin, which has a recall provision. At the national level, most of us feel trapped by Donald Trump as a four-year president. The alternative is to try to figure out how he can be impeached. And the problem I have with the impeachment clause is not only that it takes a lot of time, but also, frankly, speaking to somebody who's taught at a law school now for 37 years, lawyers get involved. And if lawyers get involved, by and large, they're going to shout at one another about what counts as a high crime or misdemeanor. Uh, we saw this with the Clinton impeachment roughly 20 years ago, and that, I think, is a bad thing. If we had a procedure for a vote of no confidence, which is actually what I prefer, mm -hmm. that let's say two-thirds of Congress voting together, not the House separately in the Senate, separately with two thirds of Congress coming together, if they say, you know, we really have lost confidence in this person with regard to issues of war and peace, life and death. If you've lost confidence on matters of tax policy, you're not going to impeach. A, you're not going to fire a president. But if you're frightened when you go to bed over fundamental issues like life and death, peace and war, then you want to fire the president. The virtue of vote of no confidence is that it's not a legal decision. It's a political decision. Do you have confidence in this person or not? You can hear the full interview with Sanford Levinson. It's available for subscribers today at PeterBCollins.com, at iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spreaker, and most of the locations where you find my podcasts. Well, you may have heard now, because they have been leaked, that there are a series of text messages that were sent between two members of the staff of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And they are involved in a personal relationship of some sort. I don't know if Peter Strzok, who spells his name S-T-R-Z-O-K, 
He's an investigator at the FBI. Uh, and Lisa Page, with whom he shared these communications. I don't know if they're married and this is an affair or if they're just single people who happen to be dating. It's not my business, and frankly, I don't care. But their text messages have been leaked after they were delivered to the House Judiciary Committee. Wonder who did that. And Stroke has been under the gun from Republican uh, commentators. The talking points have been aimed at Stroke for weeks now. I've been hearing them from Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh. And it's fair to say that there are questions here. Because Strzok was at first assigned to the team that was investigating the Hillary Clinton email issues. And then in the bizarre uh, announcement last July 6th of 2016, James Comey said that he would not be pressing charges against Hillary Clinton. Now, the FBI director doesn't press charges. At any rate, uh, Strzok was part of that. And then after the exoneration, he was assigned to the Trump-Russia investigation, which was surfacing, we believe, after the FBI got a copy of the Trump dossier prepared by Fusion GPS for the Clinton campaign. Now, there are real questions about the Comey investigation, about the way the FBI reached its determination, about allegations that Comey had written his statement exonerating Hillary weeks before it was actually issued. But these emails between Strzok and Page, I don't find to be particularly damaging. Now, they make comments about Trump. They clearly don't support him. But just because you work at the FBI doesn't mean you give up your rights as a citizen. So some of Strzok's comments include, God, Hillary should win a billion to zero. The woman Page says, did you hear Trump make a comment about the size of his dick earlier? This man cannot be president. Page once uh, said, Trump is a loathsome human. Strzok, yet he may win. Good for Hillary. So this is during the primary, and Strzok is uh, guessing that uh, if Trump was the Republican nominee, that Hillary would handily beat him. Then uh, Strzok asks, would Trump be a worse president than Cruz? Page says, Trump, yes, I think so. <laughs> then there's a comment on April 2nd from Page. Uh, so look, you say we text on that phone when we talk about Hillary because it can't be traced. You were just venting because you feel bad that you're gone so much, but you can't be helped right now. That can't be helped right now. So apparently they thought by, that by using burner phones for these text messages that they would never surface. And that shows that people who work at the FBI, including a high-ranking investigator, don't have a clear idea of the domestic surveillance that continues on a daily basis here. <laughs> then they uh, trade comments about what a douche or douchebag uh, Trump is. Uh, that was used quite a bit. Later, Strzok says Trump is a fucking idiot, is unable to provide a coherent answer. They're watching a debate. And uh, Strzok then asks, what the fuck happened to our country? So you get the background here. Today, Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general who's in charge of the Trump-Russia investigation because Jeff Sessions recused himself, he faced a lot of hostile questions from Republicans citing these text messages and saying that uh, one of Mueller's top investigators was deeply biased. Mueller did bounce him from the investigation in July, and this is all surfaced because of a, an inspector general investigation of those issues. So I, I do concede that the Republicans have a point. But I don't think that it will uh, achieve their goal of undermining or derailing the Mueller investigation. And, you know, I, I have my own issues with Mueller and with the special counsel and all of this stuff. Uh, but <laughs> that is the state of play at the moment. Now, with Roy Moore losing in Alabama... Al Franken doesn't really have much of a leg to stand on to withdraw his resignation. He could. But the governor of Minnesota, himself a former senator, Mark Dayton, has announced that his lieutenant governor will be named to replace Franken when he actually submits his resignation. This would be an interim appointment, 
and Tina Smith, the lieutenant governor, will have to run in November to hold the seat, I believe, for another two years until Franken's term actually expires. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, this is going to be very interesting because uh, Tina Smith, to her credit, used to run Planned Parenthood in the Twin Cities. She does have a background of uh, business, uh, Stanford University. Oh, actually, it was a, a political science degree. And then business administration from Dartmouth College as a Ph.D., and uh, she worked for uh, General Mills for a while. That doesn't make her a corporate tool. But she's not a flaming liberal, uh, perhaps except on issues of reproductive rights. So uh, what Dayton has done is set in motion uh, an open primary where Tina Smith will be the incumbent. But uh, it, it essentially does invite others to run for the seat. And that might be the most democratic way to proceed. A couple of Trump's judicial nominations have been formally rejected, and the White House is expected to withdraw the name of Brent Talley for a federal judgeship in the Middle District of Alabama. And uh, another character here, uh, oh, I've got to get it out of the depths of this article, uh, a guy named Mateer, who was uh, nominated for a seat in Texas. They have both received uh, not qualified ratings from the uh, American Bar Association, and uh, the tally nomination was also compounded because he failed to disclose in his application a conflict of interest that his wife, Ann Donaldson, is chief of staff to the White House counsel, Don McGahn. Uh, McGahn. So that is a setback for Trump, but uh, don't be fooled. The Republicans are packing the courts with young, conservative, white male judges. The fact that these two got bumped doesn't really change that so much. Good news for the protesters who were there on January 20th, Inauguration Day, this past year. Many of them are accused of rioting and other charges that could put them in prison for a long time. But the judge in the case, in evaluating the first six-pack of uh, accused, and there are 180 more left, 188, uh, he threw out the charges of rioting. And that brings it down to simple uh, misdemeanor charges, I think, in most cases. And that is very good news because it appeared that the Justice Department <clears throat> was demanding very extreme prosecution in this case. Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel is producing serious blowback. Less from the Palestinians and Arabs than we expected, but more from European anti-Semites. There's been a wave of anti-Semitic incidents in Sweden. There was a synagogue and a funer funeral chapel, chapel pardon me, that were targeted with firebombs. Uh, there have been protests in Germany, the United Kingdom, and in Sweden. And Palestinian leader Abbas has firmly rejected any future role for the United States as a mediator between the Palestinians and the State of Israel. Because of the decision about Jerusalem, Abbas has formally declared that Palestinians will no longer accept the U.S. as a mediator, and this does complicate things. Now, Rexon Tillerson, who may be on his way out as Secretary of State, we don't really know, he suggested that the move of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem might not actually take place during Trump's current term in office. But this does certainly roil the waters and makes any future peace deal problematic. A new poll of Israelis shows that uh, they are deeply divided. About 45% or just under half believe the country's democratic system of government is in serious danger. But when you look at the divide between left and right, it's pretty stark. Only 23% of Jewish right-wing and religious voters fear that Israel's democracy in danger is in danger. But among Jewish left-wing voters, the number is 72%. That's even more than the 65% of Arab citizens of Israel who feel that way. The survey also shows that nearly three-quarters of Jewish right-wing voters 
believe that the leftist judiciary, media, and academia interfere with the elected right wing's ability to rule. But on the other side, 79% of secular Jews believe the religious population is gradually taking control of the state. Rexon Tillerson has also eased the U.S. posture toward North Korea. Now, it's a little contradictory. But he has said that the U.S. is ready to begin exploratory talks with North Korea without preconditions. And then he asserted one condition, we need a period of quiet without new nuclear or missile tests. Now, that is uh, less onerous than what the Trump administration has been saying in the recent past. And Tillerson also said the U.S. has been talking to China about what the U.S. and China would do in the event of a conflict or regime collapse in North Korea, saying that the Trump administration has given Beijing assurances that U.S. troops will pull back to the 38th parallel after we secure the North's nuclear weapons. So that suggests we're planning an invasion. Good luck with that. And China has also revealed that it's building a network of refugee camps along its 880-mile border with North Korea, preparing for an exodus in the event of a, a serious conflict. And we wrap up today with a series of stories here about uh, climate change and its impact. This has been a devastating year of extreme weather events and a peer-reviewed study. It was, its release was delayed for peer review to buttress it for expected attacks from Trump and other deniers. But researchers say that Hurricane Harvey's unprecedented deluge of uh, precipitation was made three times more likely by climate change. The storm left 80 people dead, 800,000 people in need of assistance. The cost of the damage caused by Hurricane Harvey has been estimated at $190 billion. And another report issued by the American Meteorological Society, say that five times fast, assesses 21 different extreme weather events in 2016, and most of the events can be attributed at least in part to human-caused climate change. One of the wildfires uh, out of the four or five in the Los Angeles area, the Skirball Blaze, has been determined to have been caused by homeless people who had a fire to keep warm or to, be, uh, to cook some food. This fire led to the destruction of $20 million of fancy homes in the uh, suburb of Bel Air. And backlash is expected against the homeless population. Meanwhile, in Paris, two years after the Paris Accords were ratified, there is a follow-up meeting and everybody's there except Trump. And business leaders are promising changes. Bill Gates is there, Richard Branson. They announced a dozen international projects to curb climate change. The World Bank president said his agency will stop financing oil and gas projects in two years. And the French have announced that 13 American scientists have been uh, awarded grants to study climate change in France while Trump is president. Thirteen of the 18 winners were U.S.-based researchers, and uh, they will be awarded millions of euros to study the issue. And finally, here in San Francisco, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has allowed a case to go forward that's been brought by 21 young Americans. They filed this back in 2015 while Obama was president. They contend that the obligation to protect public resources from climate change, is being ignored at the peril of these young people and their futures. And while the government has tried to dismiss the case because they think it's preposterous, Chief Judge Sidney Thomas said the process that the administration wants the court to halt is a routine procedure the courts seldom interrupt. So at least at this stage, the case will continue. Thanks for joining me today for my daily news and comment podcast. We give it away free. You're free to share it, and I hope you will. And this podcast is available on YouTube. I'm Peter B. Happy train.